Wander Middle-Earth in the Lore of the Rings podcast, where we wander the world of J.R.R. Tolkien. In the Lore of the Rings podcast, we explore the inspiring tales and rich mythology of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings Legendaria, and connect it to the movies and the new Rings of Power series. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more, you'll find a new lore-packed episode every Thursday. Come wander and not be lost with the Lore of the Rings podcast. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Carla Damron, author of the novel The Orchid Tattoo. Carla, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your novel, The Orchid Tattoo, how would you describe the novel? I would describe it as crime fiction um, that I hope will help make a difference in impacting the crime of, of human trafficking particularly domestic trafficking. Um, but basically, it's, a, it's, it's good suspense that holds you, keeps you reading. It's a page turner, but also might have you reflect on uh, just how human trafficking happens in America and how it touches so many lives without us knowing. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write the Orchid Tattoo? Yeah, I'm a clinical social worker, and for a while I worked as an executive director of the local chapter or the state chapter for National Association of Social Workers. And in that role, I did advocacy to get more um, more progressive um, legislation to combat human trafficking. So I did a lot of advocacy, and I met survivors, and I was so struck by how it happens just in our own neighborhoods and how how much I hadn't known before I got involved in that work. And so the character of uh, of Kitten kind of popped up. She she just kind of emerged um, in, in thinking about the crime and thinking about the victims. Um, and then once I had her, and then Georgia had been the character of Georgia, who's, who's the main protagonist. Georgia is a social worker who um, is looking for her missing sister. She had been kind of floating in my brain for a while, but I was like, oh, this is the kind of crime that, uh, crime that Georgia would be. It would be really interesting to see her um, tackling this. So that's sort of how it got going. And I'm curious, um, in terms of human trafficking, what kind of research did you do about um, trafficking? Well, I had done a lot of research when I was doing the advocacy work, Mm -hmm. um, and I was a part of the Richland County Human Trafficking Task Force. I got to know some law enforcement folks, um, some survivors, some social workers that were connected to it, some people that ran shelters, the state human trafficking task force. I've met some of the folks involved with that. Um, So so life kind of gave me research, but then I did a lot on my own just reading about how it happens. One of the most um, significant things about human trafficking that I don't think people know is how how the target, how the traffickers groom their victims, how they how it's not a it's rarely where they just snatch you up off the street, although that does happen. It's more likely to be a slower process where they groom their victims and kind of uh, seduce them into believing that they could have a relationship with this um, with this uh, job, with this um, pill, essentially, mm-hmm. and how often they target foster kids in South Carolina. It's estimated that there were 236 foster kids that were pulled into human trafficking. That's a horrific number. Um, so that's what I wanted to write about. And when you're talking about human trafficking, I'm assuming you're talking about um, uh, people who are kind of forced into sex work. Right. It's it's about that, but it's also about labor trafficking, too. Oh, okay. um, the, the, the bad guy in my book um, does, he sort of uh, multi, multi-talented. I mean, he's, he has labor trafficking going on, but he finds that the sex trafficking is far too lucrative for him to turn his back on it. And he finds a way to become incredibly rich doing it. And when you're saying labor trafficking, I'm assuming you're talking about people who are kind of um, coerced into extremely low-paying jobs. Right. Um, for example, there's a massage parlor in my um, in my uh, in my book where people are just forced to work ungodly hours and 
hardly paid at all, and their living situation is ter- is horrific, and they're not allowed to leave. Um, typically, um, massage parlors are one place where it happens. Actually, nail salons are another place where it happens. And often these are internationally trafficked people, mm-hmm. so they have the fear of um, of you know homeland security coming right. or immigration coming down on them. So it's very hard for them to get help because of that fear. And that's what the traffickers hold over their heads. Got it. And I'm curious, how do you use your social work background in your fiction? In so many ways. Um, because, I, you know, one thing about being a social worker, it's not what you do. It's kind of who you are. So even if I didn't want to write about social issues, I, w- I wind up doing it. It just, it just kind of emerge. Mm-hmm. Um so that's one thing. It's a passion of mine. But two, uh, I I was a clinical social worker for oh, 30 years or so. And um, so my main, my protagonist, the woman who is trying to solve the crime here, Georgia Thayer, I have her as somebody who's actually experiencing mental illness. So she is someone in recovery who still has symptoms, but works as a social worker, is very functional. Um and I wanted to write about someone with mental illness who's a hero, uh, because I feel like fiction too often criminalizes mental illness. And really, poly- I mean, in the news, we criminalize mental illness way too much. So I wanted to be sensitive to that and to present a character who has serious mental health issues, but still lives a vital life. Um, and that's definitely my social work kind of leaking in. Um, I just, it's, something important to me. It's a message that I really wanted to send. Well, what was your initial uh, fiction writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? And actually, this isn't my first novel. This is my fifth fifth novel. Um, So in my family, we love mysteries. Um, Whenever (laughs) we travel, you know, you might have a suitcase full of your clothes, but you might have a second suitcase full of books. (laughs) And you just dump out the books and you know, I give my books to my sister and she gives me her books. And, yeah. So um, so th- when I wanted to write, I thought I've always thought I wanted to write a mystery. And so, God, I don't know, 20 years, 20 plus years ago, I decided to try to write one. And so I began writing the first one, which was Keeping Silent. Um, and that got published. So I have three books in that series. And then after writing those mystery novels, I wanted to try something different. And um, I had this idea for a women's fiction project. So um, I wrote this book called The Stone Necklace. Well, I started writing it, and it was a very complicated, uh, very complicated structure. It's got five points of view, and they're kind of braided narratives. The characters kind of touch on each other, then they're apart, then they touch on each other again. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in the process of writing that, I quickly learned that I did not know enough about what the heck I was doing. <laughs> so it actually sent me to graduate school. And I went and I got my MFA in creative writing, mainly so I could finish writing that darn novel. And I did. And it came out in 2017. And it was, um, it was chosen to be the one book one community read for Columbia, South Carolina, where I live. And then it won the Women's Fiction Writers Association uh, Star Award for Best Novel. So I was very thrilled about that. So I would say in The Orchid Tattoo, it's it's a little like women's fiction, but it's also crime fiction because the the female characters definitely have an arc of discover of self discovery um, and recovery, and uh, just there's a change that happens in each of the three main uh, pr- women protagonists. But it's also suspenseful. Well, what appeals to you about writing crime fiction? I must have a really devious mind. <laughs> <laughs> My husband says, as long as I'm killing people on paper, he feels safe. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. It's just kind of, I love the puzzle of it. I love creating puzzles that might be difficult to solve but can be solved, you know, and I love it when pe- readers and, and readers for this this novel have said, oh my gosh, you got me at the end. I really didn't expect such and such. And I'm like, well, the clues were there. 
<laughs> but anyway, so I love puzzles. So that was that's part of it. Um, and it's a genre that so many people enjoy reading. And so as a writer, you want exposure. You want people to read your stuff. So uh, I don't have it in me to write romances, which is probably the most popular genre. I just don't have it in me to do that. So um, so mysteries were it was a pretty logical fit. Now, I won't say I'm going to exclusively write mysteries because I'll there's a good chance I'll try another women's fiction project. I I kind of write what what comes to me. I write, mm-hmm. you know, the idea that takes root and stays with me and wants me to work on it. That's what's going to take my attention. That's great. Well, what was your writing process like as you were writing The Orchid Tattoo? Do you outline your novels extensively or did you just dive into the narrative? Yeah, I would say when I'm doing a, a mystery novel, I'm more of a pantser than a plotter, for one thing, mm-hmm. because I love the journey of discovery. I don't want it all planned out, and then I don't have anything to discover when I start writing. But also, once the characters become real to me, and they become incredibly real, um, once they become real and I start hearing their story, I can't. I can't control where they're necessarily going to go. So I'm going to have to, if I plot out a whole novel, I'm probably going to have to, you know, scratch that plot because this <laughs> character doesn't want to do that. Or that character has decided, no, she's not going to be a crime victim, you know, the murder victim or whatever. So it it sounds a little deranged the way my head works, and it probably is, but um, but that's that's really true. So uh, it, it's the process of discovery. It's a process of getting to know these characters and seeing where they want to go, and then it's sort of herding cats to make, you know, to to braid them together and get a, a coherent story with one main theme. Uh, that's, that's sort of my task. But I will say this, when I'm writing a mystery, I do want the main thread already kind of planned in my head. I want to know who dies, who did it, and why they did it. I kind of want to know that from the very beginning. But all of the subplots and the other characters, they're going to be created along the way. And it may, you know, that main plot may change, but I still like to have that going in that I have an idea what the main thread is. Sure. Well, what writing advice would you offer to those who are writing their own stories or novels? Um, The most important thing, of course, is to, you know, button chair, you know, to actually write. And people have full, you know, complicated lives and that becomes difficult, but, but you have to just kind of chisel out time and do it. But the other advice I have is if you can't write every day, and a lot of people can't, you can, well, in terms of sitting down and typing or, or sketching, you know, drafting in a notebook, you, know, you may not have time to do that, but keep the novel with you in your brain, Keep thinking about it. You know, when I go to bed, if I'm working on a project, when I'm going to, when I'm laying in bed going to sleep, I'm probably thinking about plot points. I'm probably imagining what if I did such and such? What if I followed this tangent? Um, When I had a full time job, I would, you know, I had a, I had an administrative role that involved a lot of meetings. (laughs) And I would always take a notebook to the meetings and look like I was taking copious notes. (laughs) When in fact, I was scrawling in the march, you know, like I'd see somebody's eyebrows across the table and go, oh, those eyebrows will look good on Captain (laughs) Benteel. So keep it, you know, just keep it with you, even if you can't sit down and write. My other piece of advice is to study, 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 and the best place, study from the masters. So when I read, and I read a lot, um, I read for pleasure, but I also read for craft. So I'll, you know, if if I read something that's just really resonant with me, I'll take a minute, I'll, I'll kind of stop reading and say, what was it about that passage that really got to me? Or how did she make this paragraph so suspenseful? You just kind of train with the masters. You can do that from you checking books out of your of the library. If you just kind of put on an analytical head and look at the material, not so much just for reading pleasure, but for reading analysis, you know, what can I learn from this author? And I have learned from phenomenal authors who, unfortunately, I haven't met yet, <laughs> <laughs> but hope to. 
That's great. Well, what books have you read recently that you enjoyed, either fiction or nonfiction? Um, so I through the pandemic, um, Louise Penny has gotten me through the pandemic. Uh, the, I think you're uh, not the only one. Yeah, I mean, seriously, <laughs> she is just amazing. But I love, I mean, I love the mysteries in her books, but also I love that her characters, Inspector Gamache and yeah. um, Jean Guy, um, they actually have an, an arc, a character arc that extends from book one to probably book 25. That is remarkable. Um, and so I have, I've been working on the, uh, you know, I did the three mystery novels and I'm working on the fourth in that series. And um, I'm trying to just kind of imagine a long arc for the main character of Caleb Knowles and his family. You know, what what do I want to see happen over if I could do eight books, what would happen? That's one thing that she just does brilliantly. Uh, for literary, I love Elizabeth Strout. I read everything I can get my hands on by her, I think. And I've read them multiple times because she's just got so much to teach me. Um, her skill with language is remarkable. Lauren Groff is another reader, uh, another writer who has so much to teach me. I mean, she is just masterful, absolutely masterful. She has a fascinating writing technique, too. I read this that she, when she's writing, she will do a complete draft of the novel and then throw it away and start over. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Wow. And it's, it's brilliant and daring and brave. Um, I could never do it, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I don't think <laughs> but, I could do that. But it's it's really intriguing to me that that's, you know, it, that just the writing process for different writers just fascinates me. Um, so, yeah, um, John Fart is another writer um, that I really respect. I'm fiction. But his, I mean, he does crime fiction with a literary edge. Mm -hmm. His, um, his, just his narrative flows so beautifully. His, his use of metaphor and a, he just is amazing. Um, so I would say those are probably my three favorites right now. And I'm worried because I'm about to run out of Louise Penny novels <laughs> as she's not writing them fast enough. Yeah. And I'm sure you're not the only one to make that complaint either. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? Yeah, that would be awesome. I'm at uh, carladaron.com, C-A-R-L-A-D-A-M-R-O-N.com. And I have a newsletter. You can sign up for my newsletter at my website. I'm on social media, um, Carla Writes Fic in on Twitter and then Carla Darren on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I love connecting with readers. If you go to my Facebook page, you'll see way too much about my pets um, <laughs> because I'm a, a very over-involved mother of shelter pet. <laughs> so, um, so, but they're they're perfect and incredible, and you of course want to see them. Um, uh that's great. Well, again, we've been yeah. speaking again. We've been speaking with Carla Damron, author of the novel "The Orchid Tattoo." The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Carla, thanks for doing this interview. It was great, Jeff. It was lovely meeting you. Wonderful.